six is on acoustics, the sound of music. We will learn more about the physics of sound, answering three physics questions often asked by children and adults. Why do I sound so good when I sing in the shower? Why does a wine glass sing when I rub it? And why does my voice sound so different when I hear it in a recording? The study of sound is called acoustics, from the Greek word meaning to hear. Your voice vibrating the air in the shower is part of acoustics, and to understand why bathroom singing is so popular, we need to understand a little bit about sound acoustics. In part one, we looked at the mechanics of sound, how sound is actually made. But another very important part of sound is how humans perceive sound. Why this sounds better than this. They both make sound. But one is perceived as more pleasing or musical than the other. For centuries, people knew that if you built a theater in a certain way, everyone in the audience could hear the actors. Ancient Greek theaters built fifty or sixty rows of steeply banked hard benches, producing a circular shape. That nearly looks like sound or water waves. In this way, even the cheap seats could hear the actors clearly. In the world's best designed concert halls, a properly trained person with no microphone can make himself clearly heard and understood anywhere in the hall. A well-designed concert hall should have a sense of intimacy. The music should sound as if it were actually in a small hall with liveliness and warmth and full bass tones. The audience should be able to easily and precisely locate the source of the sound, and the notes should be clear and uniform over the entire hall. The concert hall should be free of unwanted noise, and the music should be blended by the time it is heard by any member of the audience. Some of the world's most acoustically superior concert halls include the Vienna Austria's Musikverein, the Gedwanhaus in Leipzig, Germany, Amsterdam's Concertenbau. The Boston Symphony Hall, the Sydney Opera House, and surprisingly, the Walt Disney Concert Hall in Los Angeles, California, home to the Los Angeles Philharmonic Orchestra. On the opening day of this concert hall, a world-famous conductor discovered mistakes in the sheet music. Just because of the remarkable acoustics in the hall. But sometimes you just need a little peace and quiet, and if you want it really quiet, as in zero sound, then you need an anechoic chamber, also known in the Guinness Book of World Records. As the world's quietest room, an anechoic chamber is a specially designed room to remove any sound from the outside and to prevent any reflection of sound while you're on the inside. The inner room is completely isolated from the rest of the building using sound-absorbing springs. The walls are lined with super sound-deadening fiberglass wedges. 
The floor is a grid of steel cable, effectively suspending you in the soundless cube. No noise reflection from any direction at all. Anechoic literally means no echo. After a few minutes, your hearing sensitivity increases, and you can hear your own heart beating. NASA has their own version of an anechoic chamber to help prepare astronauts to endure the quiet of space. Less sophisticated anechoic chambers have regular solid floors. Testing the noise level of equipment is a common use of these rooms, and some chambers can test huge things like testing the interior noise of this Hercules C-130. Based on the construction of some of the best concert halls in the world, we can isolate at least three of the most important qualities for excellent acoustics. Exceptional volume produced by hard, smooth surfaces that absorb very little sound. This is why many concert halls line the walls with hardwoods. Secondly, the hard surfaces produce an echo or reverb, reflecting the sound back, giving the music a slight lingering in the air, making each note a little fuller and richer. But perhaps the most important feature of the best concert halls in the world is their shape. Concert halls and churches shaped like a shoebox produce the best acoustics. They are longer than they are wide. A listener not only hears the sound coming directly at them, but they also hear the sound reflected off the side walls a fraction of a second later. That reflection off the walls creates the all-important stereo effect, giving the perception of a fuller, richer immersion in the sound. Which takes us back to your shower. Like a good concert hall, your shower has hard, smooth surfaces, allowing the sound to concentrate the volume, giving your voice more power. The reflection off the surfaces gives you that nice reflected reverb fullness. And the box-like structure of most showers, like a long concert hall, helps boost some of the lower end frequencies amplifying bass tones, giving a fuller sounding voice. And one other feature is the sound of raining water. It tends to fill the background with a pleasant sound, like music, that helps mask our mistakes, making us sound not too bad, at least from inside the shower. The ability to enhance your voice or to produce an echo is found in several buildings and caves around the world. They are called whisper galleries, and they take advantage of sound's ability to travel in waves, reflecting off of the surfaces in mathematically precise patterns. A limestone cave carved on the island of Sicily is such a chamber. It naturally echoes whispers. So is the magnificent dome of St. Paul's Cathedral in London, England. Just as we saw that concave mirrors can take light and concentrate it down to a single point, sound does the same thing. Acoustic mirrors are concave-shaped devices that concentrate sound and collect it like a big ear, 
channeling it down to a single point. These huge concrete acoustic mirrors were made prior to World War II to listen to the distant sound of approaching planes. Parabolic microphones make a portable version of these giants by surrounding a microphone with a half dish, enabling you to pick up small sounds from far away. These are all ways of increasing or expanding the ear's ability to hear. There are a lot of weekend projects on the web that show you how to make a parabolic microphone. Even a vinyl umbrella can act as a parabolic sound collector. This is one of those dollar store umbrella hats that you are supposed to seriously wear on your head. But instead, we've added a handle from one of these inexpensive paint rollers. Here is someone reading a book several yards away. You can hardly hear her. But put our microphone to the parabolic umbrella and it collects the sound. A microphone is a way of converting mechanical sound waves into an electrical signal so you can amplify it or record it. It is largely designed around the same principle of how your ear works. In your ear, sound waves form air pressure, which in turn presses on a thin diaphragm, your eardrum, which pushes against small bones in order to transfer the motion deep inside your head to the inner ear. Thin hairs move back and forth inside this thing, the cochlea, and it transfers this motion into electrical current. You only have about 16,000 sound receptor hairs in each ear, in each cochlea. Now, that sounds like a lot, but it's nothing compared with the 125 million photoreceptors in every eye. That means that for every 8,000 photoreceptors in your eye, you have only one sound receptor. That's why it's so easy to damage our hearing. You don't have a lot of hairs to spare. Those few hairs are all that stand between you and total silence. As it is, we naturally lose a fair percentage of our high-frequency hearing at about the age of 20, as time and noise cause the hair cells to stiffen and die, and they cannot be replaced. The microphone is similarly constructed as your ear is. In the microphone, sound forms physical pressure waves, which press against a thin eardrum-like diaphragm, transferring the motion inside the microphone. Thin copper wire is wrapped around a magnet, and the wire moves as it is pushed back and forth, just like in your ear. This movement of copper wire over a magnet makes an ever-changing electrical field, which we will talk about more in the electricity segment. This electrical field is transferred over wires, which can then be recorded or transferred to a speaker. Now, a speaker is a microphone in reverse, turning electrical signals into mechanical sound waves. The electrical signals from the microphone make the thin copper coil around this magnet move up and down with precision, which physically pushes against this plastic or paper diaphragm. The diaphragm pushes and pounds against the surrounding air, duplicating the movement of the magnet inside, making an exact copy of the sound that originally hit the microphone diaphragm. Most speakers divide the fast-moving high-frequency movements to the tweeter and the slower low-frequency sounds to the lower speaker, or the woofer. 
Humans are designed to hear sounds from about 20 cycles per second, or hertz, to about 20,000 cycles per second. Anything above 20,000 cycles per second is called ultrasound or ultrasonic, and most people can't hear it at all. So what good is a sound that you can't hear? Ultrasonic sound can produce images of a baby in the mother's womb. Since ultrasonic waves don't spread out as much as normal sound waves, they can be aimed and directed. Bats and dolphins use ultrasound to navigate and locate food. Ultrasound can also be used to weld plastic parts together, or to kill sewage bacteria, or to test for flaws in industrial material. You can even use it to clean jewelry. See? Lots of things can be done with a sound that you can't hear. In addition, some store owners take advantage of ultrasound to discourage bored young people from hanging around the front of their stores. The ability to hear very high frequencies, like about 18,000 cycles per second, starts deteriorating at about the age of 18. Stores will install a device that goes by various names, like the mosquito, or the sonic screen, or the mosquito alarm. It plays a very high-pitched and annoying sound at about 17 or 18,000 hertz. Almost nobody over 25 can hear it, but teenagers easily hear this frequency, and they move on. Here is seven seconds of the mosquito frequency. Really high sounds, like the one you just heard, or didn't hear, are called ultrasonic. Really low sounds are called infrasonic, below our threshold of hearing, below 20 Hertz. Both can be used as weapons of war and in crowd control. Sound cannons mounted on ships or vehicles are designed to make sounds that produce a sense of anxiety or agitation or direct very loud sounds to help disperse crowds. Here's one more interesting acoustic bit of information. This is a barber pole. This barber pole creates the illusion of a never-ending spiral. There is also something called the sonic barber pole, or the shepherd tone invented by Roger Shepard. It creates the illusion of an audio pitch continually ascending or descending in pitch, yet it ultimately never seems to actually end or go anywhere, just like a visual barber pole. After a while, you'd think it would top out, but it doesn't. It just keeps going on and on. So now we have some kind of idea of why your musical talents sound so good in the shower. It's based on proper acoustics. But what is it that makes music so musical? In other words, what is the difference between this? And this. Sounds in nature, or even a dog barking, produce complex waveforms, but with great irregularity. Music, on the other hand, produces complex waveforms, but with repeating patterns. In other words, music has order. One is noise. The other is music.
We said that sound needs frequency, also called pitch, and it also needs loudness, which we call volume or amplitude. But there is one other distinguishing quality that is subtle, and it's called timbre. Timbre is that musical quality that makes instruments sound different from each other, even if they are playing the same note and at the same volume. Two trumpets playing the exact same note can sound different from each other, and usually do. And a violin playing the exact same note will sound different still. That difference is timbre. Timbre exists because each note from a musical instrument is actually a complex tone of many frequencies happening at the same time. The vibration with the slowest rate is called the fundamental frequency and is the loudest. The other frequencies are things like harmonics and overtones. These blend together with the fundamental frequency to give the timbre of that particular instrument, and each instrument, even though their fundamental frequency is the same, will have a different timbre because of all the spices added by those harmonics and overtones. And I know it looks like the word should be pronounced maybe timber, but it's not. It's timbre or tambre. If you want to be French, timbre is a French word, and it means tone. In order for something to be music and not just noise, it needs order and rhythm, and a quality that is pleasing to our ears, which is something that is not easy to quantify with numbers or science, because. It's a human perception of melody and rhythm and harmony. It's a complex mixture of frequencies and timbre and volume that is pleasing to our ears. That is music. The Thanksgiving meal has largely ended, and the adults in the family are all lingering, talking about adult things. A small boy is also at the table, bored, waiting patiently to either be excused from the table, which won't happen anytime soon, or hoping Grandma will soon recognize the time is right to bring out the dessert. He fiddles with the stuff on the table, eats another green olive, and plays with the silverware until his mother tells him to stop. At some point, his attention is drawn to a wine glass, where he absent-mindedly rubs his finger around the rim, and to his astonishment, it quietly sends out a ringing tone, like nothing he's ever heard before. And if a little was interesting, a lot will be astonishing. And so he does it a lot. And the conversation at the table stops as all ears are drawn to the magical sound ringing out from the glass. He makes the glass sing, and sing, and sing again until finally he's in trouble again, and his mother flicks his hand and tells him to behave. But it's too late. The genie is out of the bottle, and the magic of that moment will follow him and every Thanksgiving dinner for the rest of his life. But why does it sing? What is happening to the glass? Well, it is made of a solid crystal structure, and when you tap it. You can hear it willingly vibrate, rapidly pushing the air, making sound waves. 
This is much the same way as a bell behaves. The hard metal crystal structure vibrates, pushing the air in regular vibrations that we perceive as sound waves. As you move your finger around the rim, your finger alternately slips and sticks to the rim quicker than you can see. It is actually called slip and stick motion. And it is the same motion that causes a squeaky door hinge or the chalk to scratch across the board. Wetting your finger makes the slip and stick more effective and as it starts and stops in rapid regular patterns around the rim, the glass begins to vibrate, transferring energy from the motion of your finger into the glass itself. Galileo wrote of the phenomena back in 1683. More recently, Anna and Arik Szafraniec of Poland have created the world's largest glass harp made of high quality wine glasses. Each glass is tuned to a different pitch based on the size of the glass and by adding water. Here they play fugue in D minor using only wine glasses, a glass harp. Benjamin Franklin was so fascinated with this effect, he invented an instrument called the harmonica that connected several glass bowls horizontally on an iron shaft. A foot treadle rotates the shaft and in this way the player's hands are still while the glass bowls rotate under them. Just about anything will vibrate, but most things will vibrate at a greater amplitude at certain frequencies more than other frequencies. This is the object's resonant frequency. By tapping on the glass, you can hear what that frequency is. And an electronic tuner can tell you exactly how many hertz or cycles per second. A tuning fork is simply a two-pronged piece of metal of a specific length with the prongs forming a U-shape. A tuning fork is an acoustic resonator. Each one has a specific resonant frequency. By striking one of the forks, it vibrates at a specific frequency, so many cycles per second. This one is vibrating at 256 cycles per second, which is pretty frequent. Place the handle on a hard surface and the pure tone from the forks is amplified. You can even place the handle of a tuning fork against your teeth or forehead and you will hear the tone as clearly as if it was next to your ear. The sound vibrations bypass the normal air transmission through your outer and middle ear and it uses bone transmission, transmitting the sound directly into the cochlea of your inner ear. A music box is usually a little house with a mechanical mechanism inside that plays music. The mechanism has a series of tiny metal prongs that act like tiny tuning forks vibrating to the resonant frequency of the metal 
when the pins of the rotating cylinder pluck the tuned prongs. Longer, thicker prongs make lower vibrations. Shorter, thinner prongs vibrate faster and make higher pitches. They also need a sound box to amplify the sound, like the hard surface did for the tuning forks. That's why the mechanism is usually screwed into a wooden music box. It acts like the soundboard to amplify the sound waves. If the resonant frequency is exactly right, and the amplitude, or volume, is sufficient, the vibrations can actually destroy the object. Something most boys secretly hope might happen at the Thanksgiving dinner. But here, the frequency and volume is enough to break the wine glass. Now, it's rare, but some people can produce sufficient volume at just the right frequency to break the glass with just their voice. Earlier, we saw how bone can directly transmit sound into your inner ear. This happens to be the reason why when you hear your recorded voice, it sounds different to you and why you generally don't like it. Here's the physics behind it. You hear your voice normally as your voice enters your ears, but you also hear yourself as your voice vibrates through your own head bones and the sound goes directly into your inner ear. It actually takes a fraction of a second longer to travel through bone and the slower waves deepen the frequency, enhancing the sound and giving more of a fullness to how you sound to yourself. Kind of like what happens when you are singing in the shower. The voice you hear every day when you speak is a combination of the sounds from both of these paths, air conducted and bone conducted. But when you hear a recording of yourself, you are only hearing the high air conducted part of your voice taken from further away than you normally hear yourself. What you hear in the recording is closer to the way your voice actually sounds to everyone else. You can partly reverse the effect and just hear the low tones from bone conduction by using earplugs and blocking the tone that goes into your ear. That way mostly what you hear is the bone conducted low tones. Sound is as important to us as light. Many people, if given the choice to lose either their hearing or their sight, are hard pressed to decide which sense is most precious to them, and most weigh them as equally important. We communicate most effectively by looking at each other and speaking to each other. Sound teaches us, enriches our lives, and can often move us in very powerful and subtle ways.